how much money you have in inventory. Like you don't, it's not, sometimes you don't have to raise prices. Sometimes you just have to free up the inventory and let things start flowing. The money comes in, the clients are happier, the staff's jobs get easier because they're not fighting with the clients. Hey, law firm owners, welcome to the Your Practice Master Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm MPS. And I'm Richard James. And today, Michael, we've got a good friend, our partner, Bert Diener, who is, we've watched bro from a multi-million dollar firm that didn't have profit to now a multi-million dollar firm with massive profit and massive growth, but also tremendous character and a heart of giving. I've been most impressed. You're successful as a business owner. You've built great industries inside the legal niche. But I've been most impressed by your overall giving. You give to your team. You give to your clients. You give to the community. It's fun to watch the way you do business. Thank you for being a part of our world. No, thank you guys. You have helped us uh, do it all. So we really appreciate it. Let's kick it off right. You want to get the... Let's break the ice. Break the ice. Bert, let's break the ice. What's something that maybe not everyone knows about you? That I take all the credit for everything, and I really do nothing, so. <laughs> I, did we not know that about him? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Maybe I thought I had y'all fooled, yeah. and that's, uh, the joke's on me. I, I, at the end of the day, I, I appreciate that, but the, you are the general, and the firm needs a general. Correct. And you are the visionary, and you, I mean, you did it all. Right. right. So everything you're asking everybody to do, you've actually done yourself, correct? Simultaneously. Simultaneously, yeah. Even yes. though you didn't speak Spanish. That's right. You still had to figure out how to get all that stuff done. That's right. I, I'm not afraid of, of being bad at something. Yeah. Um, that doesn't bother me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to draw a pattern there, everyone that has sat on that stage today yeah. has all done every role in the firm and made sure they understood it before they placed someone else there to do it. So mm -hmm. that's just something to pull from. But, Bert, why don't you set the stage again? We're happy to bleep this in the recording if you'd like. But what did owner's benefit look like in 2023? So for us, owner's benefit is a little bit different, right? So I have to factor in, like, all the bonuses that we do because I have certain owner's benefit that comes at the firm, kind of benefits us. And then we do kind of a profit-first model where we push everything over of the profit. So we have a firm rule that Stephanie and I, we get 25% of profit and 75% is distributed to everybody who's involved. Okay, so wait, 75% of every dollar the owners make is put into profit theoretically and you give that away to the team. You know, whatever we have, the way we believe is anything over expenses is profit. So that all, every single penny goes into the profit pool and 75% of that is distributed to everyone else. Did so, everybody, did that hit everybody correctly? Yeah, you got so it. So we're an eight figure firm. These numbers are big. So, but when we look at it as we've done stuff right now, considering everything right now, even in our growth cycle, because we've built, literally built three offices this year, we still are at a 40% profit margin, that being factored. That's with reinvestment of capital. That's with building out of cash three offices. So we would be closer to 45% or more, probably even closer to 50%. I have a, I mean, within probably 18 months, I know within 18 months, we'll be at 60%. Yeah, so the, the numbers, everything we have done has been built to scale. Everything has been built to scale. So I can handle, with the exception of appointment slots, you know, we can handle a 50% growth in one month and we don't miss a beat. So that's how we've planned. Just to give everybody scope, I know we talked about this before, but just to make sure we give them scope, how, how many new cases did you open in January? Yeah, January we opened 680. 680 new cases in January. How many open cases do you have at any one given time right now? Yeah, it's, you know, 11,000-ish right now and it will go higher. My goal is by 2030 that we'll do 50,000 a year, 50,000 new cases a year by 2030, and we're on track. We're actually ahead of schedule for office building, revenue, cases, everything is on track. But, you, but yet you share so freely. Right. You don't seem concerned that somebody might 
swipe and deploy your material and compete with you in your market. That doesn't ever seem to be a factor in your radar. No, not at all. I mean, it's, I mean, there are certain things that if you are trying to go into a market and be the biggest one, you put a target on your back. There's a sweet spot in terms of a client acquisition cost that we know we want to get into. The bigger you get, the more your client acquisition cost increases. Correct. So it's easier for me to open another office and stay within that sweet spot you know, continue to expand that way. You keep the target off of your back. You diversify by markets. And so it's a strategy that's working for us. And we just got to stay a couple jurisdictions ahead every year. So we're already licensed and everything prepared so I can go to opening offices and we just keep it going. Okay. Is it safe to say that flow is a, that profitability in 2020? Yes, flow is everything right now in my world. Everything, this whole idea of flow, whether it's from a personal perspective, that's why I shaved my head basically. I think there's a natural way that people should grow. There's a natural way that people should help one another. There's a natural way to create alignment in an organization. And so if you study and you build things to recognize whenever there's a constraint, you find the biggest one, we find the root cause of the issue. If we can, as a group, identify and eliminate that, we're going to increase flow. But flow at its heart is, you know, we have a number of y'all out here that we've shared stuff with. We've tried to be shared freely, and they've had some really incredible, like, results. But flow right now is telling me even my $100 million goal that I had is probably 2030, we're probably going to crush it. Probably going to crush it. Now... Okay, for those that are listening in a pod or even here that don't know what the heck flow is, yes, it is a bit of a Frankenstein monster of a combination of a couple of theories out there that you've put together to make sense for law firm production, correct? That's 100%. So where does the foundation of that come from? Right, so there's basic five methodologies that exist out there in different industries. One is lean, that was primarily created by Toyota. One was basically agile, which was basically kind of built on the back of lean through software. There's Scrum that was built in the backbone of Agile. So each one's an iteration because circumstances change, they evolve the methodologies. Kanban, which is also a derivative that has been matured in other industries, which was started by Toyota and Lean as well. And then we have the theory of constraints, which basically helps us make sure that our priorities are always in alignment because everybody has too much to do. Your ability to prioritize and execute on that is the biggest one. And then there's the sixth one actually, which is Six Sigma, which is basically identifying these points that you can get continuous improvement over time. A lot of these methodologies do not apply to law. So if you strip out what's unnecessary and you pull it together, what you basically have is you see why they work because they're basically in conformance with human nature and having everybody have the same goals, everybody win, and any friction you eliminate. So it's very logical, but you have to do it and it starts blowing your mind. It really blow right now, it's still blowing my mind. I'm a different firm than I was a week ago as a result. Mm. You made an off-handed statement to me last night, or us, while we are sitting at the table, I don't know if you caught this, where he said, honestly, I don't think we'd been able to get where we are had it not been for coming down to Mexico with staff because we wouldn't have been able to afford to scale. Is that accurate? Yeah, I was broke before then. I mean, I st- we came down here originally. I was pretty new into the program. We were like the McCraneys. We had an issue from a staffing perspective. But all of us, as, as, as every business in America, has the issue that because payroll and inflation, when it's done, no matter what you do, basically your payroll is going to eat into it. Mm -hmm. And so the harder you work, people are like, I don't know, why am I even doing this? I'm basically working just to pay everybody else. And there's this struggle. Well, I'm going to pay you more, but you're not doing more. And so you basically break the cycle by getting into a different arrangement where people are not, don't have that same perspective. There is margin there. People do want to grow. So you do have a responsibility down here to keep them engaged, to help them grow, find a win-win. But we would not. It, I would be trapped like George was. I'm not that smart. I needed to cheat. Mm-hmm. And I found a shortcut, but it would take some work. But I will tell you, 75% of my firm is in Mexico. Really? Seven, we are a Mexican law firm doing business in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so, interesting question. How do you handle the, and you answered this to me, and I think it's a good answer to everybody else and to anybody who's listening from Mexico, because... Sometimes I hear from the folks in Mexico, well, yeah, but 
that's not what they make in the U.S. to do this job. Right. Right. And I think your answer was spot on, which was what? Yeah, this, if everything was equal, we wouldn't be here. Right. Right. So we come down here and our job is to help you make more money than you would otherwise. So we can make more money otherwise. Everything has to be a win win. Right. So if you think things are going to be equal, what you're thinking right now is win lose. And you either have to be mature enough to work with us. And if you're mature, you're going to benefit. But if you're selfish, you're going to lose and we can find somebody else. But if you trust me and let's go down this path together, we can do a lot of good together and you will be exceptionally well taken care of. But let's not play this game because that's a game you can't win. Got it. Good. So I'm going to loop back to Flo. Sure. Okay. And so for a lot of this room, they've heard of you know, the boot camp of workflow and you've gone through flow, many of them could look at it and say it's a little overwhelming. Sure. Right? So did you implement everything right off the bat in Diener Law? Or? No, no, no. I haven't okay. implemented flow and everything in Diener Law right now. I was really crazy. We started with one specific case type and after the eight weeks, it's monumental in terms of what the results were. We spend a lot of money, like the McCraney spent a lot of money on training. We spend a lot of money on training, but we spend ridiculous money on systems, ridiculous money on developers, data people. I mean, it's stupid. It's, I'm a data company is what I am. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you that when we fix that, the morale as it switched around, you, run, you identify how much money you have in inventory. Like you don't have, it's not, sometimes you don't have to raise prices. Sometimes you just have to free up the inventory and let things start flowing. The money comes in, the clients are happier, the staff's jobs get easier because they're not fighting with the clients. They're not fighting with spinning their wheels, the amount of work on their case. And I heard something last week because we had such a big month. We beat our previous high by 155 cases. And I was worried like, oh my, are we built right now? Did I plan well enough? Are we going to basically kind of destroy what we've done? And I started doing stress checks and I interviewed every single lawyer back to back last Monday. And what they said was amazing. Number one, the way we structured, they said, no, actually, right now, I actually need more work. No kidding. Wow. I need, we need more work. And the second thing, the feedback I got on the case managers, so the ones that we had applied flow through, this blew my mind. They said, we no longer are sending work back. They've taken all the feedback we get them, they're actually doing it. We have no rework. What? So what the byproduct that was is obviously revenues went up through the roof the morale of the team, they're relaxed. And the feedback I got from the attorneys of my life is easier. I have more bandwidth. We don't need another attorney right now. I got two attorneys that are going on maternity leave at the same time. I'm like, you guys are killing me, right? I mean, we're growing right now. I'm going to blow up some other stuff. And they're like, no, actually, we're okay right now. So we're going to subtract two. We're doing that. This is real-time feedback. This is people who generally are optimizing for easy. They're like, no, stuff is this. We might not have believed you beforehand, Bert. But whatever we're doing right now is really working. We're cool. Oh. So, 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 okay, let's unpack it a little bit. Yeah. So what are the ingredients of flow? Mm-hmm. All right. So flow, there's, so there's, three, there's three fundamental components. You have that there's a perspective to flow, okay? You have to look at things fundamentally differently. There's a process to flow to basically implement it. And then there's a people component to flow. And this was borrowed from Toyota. So this isn't Bert's genius. This is just I'm smart enough to rip off people who are really smart, right? Mm. There are three types of meetings in flow. Okay. The three types of meetings, we have a planning session, we have daily stand-ups, and then you have a retrospective there at the end. In, got it. Yes, sir. Nope, good. So You're, we you have got the it. three principles. We have the three types of meetings. Yep. And then we have three types of roles of people who participate in flow. Yep. You have the team, you have the process leader, then you have the process owner. So the natural byproduct when you're looking at flow and you establish your priorities, the number one lens we look through is first is profitability. Okay. You better make sure that what we are doing is basically generating more profit. That's the oxygen. If you have the oxygen, we can go to the second tier of priorities, which is making sure we're making life better for everybody else. This is why you have to mash some of these other methodologies together because some of them believe, like with Lean or Agile, our whole purpose is to bring value to the client. I'm like, yeah, you could do that when you're a billion-dollar company. If you're behind, you can't afford to, one day I'll pay the bills. we got to pay the bills today. Mm-hmm. 
So borrowing these other components, looking through those lenses, and then following through to make sure everybody wins, the natural byproduct is one is cohesion improves, problems go out the door, but as you progress, there are different lessons. But it sounds to me like you've eliminated the traditional way of doing things. So let me take you back. Yes, sir. At one point in your journey here, what you thought you needed was like C-level team members that you thought you were going to bring outside managers in and that they were going to help replace you and they were going to be able to run the ship. And, and then there was a point when you thought that just having people work the farm system, like bringing right. them up through the farm system. So some of that still exists, but right. how has that evolved? How has that thinking evolved, and how have you gotten to here? Because this, this is a culmination of many different things you've been working on. Amen, brother. You're right, and you always bring me back down to reality and, and say, Bert, remember this part. I'm like, oh, I, I, I conveniently forgot that, Rich. Thanks. <laughs> um, but there was a point in time a number of years ago, I thought I could hire a COO and replace myself. Right. And we brought them in, paid more money than I'd ever paid from anybody else, brought them from a bigger company, thought that if I had somebody from a large corporation, of course, they know how to do everything right. There was a missing component that he didn't embody the culture. He didn't understand things well enough. And he was EOS trained or bought EOS into the- EOS trained, absolutely. Right? He was EOS trained. He was actually a CFO yep. also by previous. This guy was top shelf by everybody's definition if they looked at it. I even had people do the personality training on him. They gave me the stuff beforehand. I did all the checklists and it failed. It wasn't so much as his fault is, is that we all have a culture within our organizations. Mm -hmm. When you bring in an outside person, I think even in good to great, they talk about the majority of leaders for the good to great companies came from within, not from outside. Correct. So from our standpoint, the farm system of bringing people from the whatever position like Vicente, most of a lot of y'all know Vicente. Vicente started as a collections agent. And so now he basically helps run the firm and helps run a lot of y'all's influences, how you all do stuff here in Mexico. What is your ladder? By ladder, we have four tiers, four positions, okay. four levels of staff members. We have basically here in Mexico, we have the customer service, and then we have what we call social selling. So basically, it's the first touch with a client or a potential client. Okay. The second tier on top of that is what we call the relationship managers, the individuals that would be above customer service. They have a, a more, they have a stronger familiarity with the cases and can coach the clients, whether it's documents and making sure they continue to pay. The other side of the equation, if you take the sales track, those are our phone agents. The next tier above that that we have are our case managers, and a lot of these guys are just as good as paralegals if you had that designation, but they rise from relationship manager to the case manager component. And if you are in the phone sales, those guys, the great ones, we move them up and test them to become consultants. Right. And the fourth tier are the leaders. The leaders can step, can be actually jump out at any given time out of that equation if you're a natural leader. And for the natural leader, you have to, number one, in my opinion, is you have to be intellectual. You have to think. If you can't think and look at the numbers and see the numbers, Instead of doing stuff by gut, you can't be a leader. And the second thing is you have to be able to broker the interests of the team and the firm to lead individuals in the right direction. It's one thing to have just focused on the firm. It's one would just be focused on the team. If you can do both simultaneously, you can come beside us and we can do this together. You know what we just did? What did we do? We created the outline for the flow book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I you, mean, Bert. Right? That's right. what just happened. There you go. Did you guys catch that? Did you, did you see how that just, I mean, I, you've been thinking about this for a minute. By the way, you've been saying all these things to me in our meetings, little by little, and over the last year, I've watched this evolve, right. and I wasn't quite sure how you were going to articulate it, and you just nailed it. The three Ps, perspective, process, and people. The three M's for meetings, planning, daily, and retro. The three roles, team, process leader, process owner. And then the idea of how to focus on profit first as while we're caring for the client and then follow through to make sure the whole thing is working. And then the four levels of customer service and social selling. So you got the customer development and the, and the selling side, tier one, tier two, relationship manager, phone agent, tier three, case manager and consultants, tier four, leaders that can go in both directions. And they have to be both have an intellectual ability to access and diagnose and prescribe from the data, as well as lead the team in the soft skills that they need to lead them in. And those are the ones who lead through your process leaders and your process owners. Is that an accurate? description? 100%. Did you see that? Or did I go too fast? 
Now, Blaine has been helping me. Blaine and I have been working through this together. I've talked to you all religiously about this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I even drove one time to Charlotte. I'm like, guys, we've got to go to lunch. Let's talk through this stuff. And so we were talking. We were comparing notes. And we, we left that meeting going, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't curse a lot, but we said that because I was like, how are we going to keep up with his pace? Like, that's, you you're moving so, so fast. fast. <laughs> right. right? It was fun to watch. It was. All right. We're trying to figure out how to sell this company to Michael. Uh, yeah, we could do all that, too. <laughs> <laughs> so you were giving credit to Blaine. Sorry, I don't yeah, want to stop no, you but, doing but that. Blaine, uh, because there's a personal, there's a company perspective to this, and then there's an individual perspective to this. Mm -hmm. In order to have individuals participate and do well, I believe that to learn how to lead themselves first. Mm -hmm. You can't lead others unless you can lead yourselves. You know what I noticed when I did the walkthrough at floor four? Almost everybody had like Waitaba stickers on their computers and his self-fluence languaging all around their stuff. Absolutely. It's like, you know, everybody, we all share a victim mentality at some point in our lives and it's no different down here. So this whole idea that, listen, we don't have to settle for things. We do have the power to make a decision whether to accept something or not. And if we can all accept this decision that we are going to make things better and start to believe that it doesn't have to be harder, that fundamental belief allows you to align their interest with yours and build momentum. So for us to add four, five, six, seven, eight offices a year, this is fundamental. Identifying and clarifying this methodology that we borrowed and testing it and refining it, and then executing on the metrics that are in alignment and the methodology from that step. So I have to teach it, and then we have to use it and make sure those numbers are going there you know, this applies to any business. And it's, and obviously nothing we say is unique other than the fact of we're putting it together and we're testing it out and we're sharing with other people and we're seeing the lessons at each stage. Like, let me just say this, Don and I, we were talking uh, yesterday with Jessica, which is his office manager. And he was one of the first ones that kind of went through the boot camp. And Don was one of the first, I got a text on his phone. And he goes, Bert, I mean, uh, I think I found close to a million dollars in inventory right here. Holy cow. And I was like, man, this is beautiful. Share it with everybody else because not everybody's going to do their homework like you did, Don. And he did. He went out there and told them. And Jessica wasn't as, you know, she's not as, I mean, Don's a brilliant person. He, re he is a very, very, very sharp person. She didn't catch it at the same point. But a little a couple weeks later, she caught it. They saw the process of what they were doing. And we talked on a Wednesday evening. She said, I'm ready to go home right now and go do one of these meetings right now. She was so excited. Don wasn't pushing her to go do it. She was ready to run through the wall herself because she sees how much energy and emotion and, and potential it releases for everything. Yeah. So that's why, like right now, we talk about what is freedom for me now? Freedom is the ability to do what I feel like I'm meant to do or where I get the most enjoyment. That's freedom for me. Some people may want to buy time and not do stuff. Freedom for me is like, let me pour all of my energy into flow and see where this can take the firm and anybody else who wants to go along for the ride as well. That feeling that you get from seeing other people as excited as Jessica was, to me, that's more valuable than the money we're making. I think we just got the uh, what's got them fired up next. It question. didn't even have to ask. Yeah, it I mean, came it out is. naturally. I mean, yes. I mean, you seeing people recognizing things that they didn't even think were possible. And I had one staff member up here when we were doing initially, he fought me. I'm like, okay, Bert, you cannot be Marine right now. You have everybody watching you. Yeah. And if I go ahead and destroy this person in front of everybody else, I'm going to destroy any chance of success. So I did my best to bite my tongue and let the process do it for me. He is our biggest cheerleader now. Really? I told him at the end, after the eight-week cycle, I was going to punch you at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so now every time I, I see you, I want to hug you. <laughs> and I said, so you going through the process has made me a better leader. It's yeah. made me trust in this. And once again, this is just borrowing from everybody else and making it. Every evolution of this teaching was modified because the circumstances for that company required a change. I want to make one distinction before we have to run because we're out of clock. I'm sorry. But, no, you don't be sorry. This was good. Beyond. Yes or yes? Okay, so one distinction, just so nobody's missing the point. Flow is not limited to workflow, true or false? You know, flow is everything. Okay, flow is everything. Meaning, flow is, you should have flow in your marketing team. You should have flow in your sales team. You should have flow in your workflow in your collections team. You should have flow in your workflow. You should have flow in your leadership team. I think if you go back to your four pipelines, Rich, yep. there's a flow from dollar bill to client. 
If you go to my workflow, there is flow from hire to case closed. If you go to profit, there is a flow from money that you start with to the money you finish with. Mm -hmm. From a personnel perspective, there is a flow from what responsibility people take on and what is their perspective and what leverage they have to their ability to create maximum leverage in their organization and for themselves. There is a flow to it. And when you recognize it and you see what's basically the primary obstacle, it's the same process every single time. We've personally implemented flow and- We, we see it. It's amazing. What, what I would say we ran versions of we ran EOS for a while. Yeah. And we had a hybrid. We had a hybrid for a while. And now we, after hearing Bert's layout, we have fully bought into this idea. And we are personally seeing the fruits of this labor or effort in our results. Now we have our team coming up with their own solutions. And it's not requiring, we're not per, all, all the way there yet but we're getting to the point where it doesn't just require our brain work to figure things out. Hey Amen. Blaine challenged me to distill this down to principles. Yeah. So I've done that and I'm going through it and I'm going to share with you guys this next week kind of what we, you know, what I've started with. But I will tell you one of the fundamental components of this is, is that you have to think out loud with other people when you're doing this mm. because every single one of us have a tendency at some point in time to whatever you do new to start working your way back to how you did things beforehand. Mm. And it's because you don't have a true north. Mm. They did those studies where people don't have a compass and they say walk in a straight line in the forest and every single time they walk a circle, they come back around. And so if you do not have your primary focus to begin with and you don't continue to recalibrate, you're gonna end up right back where you started. And so that's that, why everybody gets frustrated. The person sitting in the audience going, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I'm glad you said that, Rich. Even for myself, like, you know, I spent six years watching software programmers do this on a daily basis through Agile. That was my boot camp in terms of singing. This could work someplace else. That's what Four Eyes, the biggest value I've ever got of Four Eyes is seeing how software does this and how could we modify it. But I will tell you, if you think you know how to do this, you don't. The whole point of this is you remain humble is because you keep on learning something new. It's not about you mastering this. It's about creating an alignment and seeing what actually is possible and getting the stuff out of the way. And that is a never ending process. And another up. mic drop. Another so mic. <laughs> <laughs> to the law firm owners listening to this, thank you for taking the time to listen. If this isn't your first time listening or watching around here, we ask that you make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button depending on where you're listening or watching. Make sure to show Bert some love in the comments down below. Let us know if flow is of interest to you and hit that like button. Bert, thank you very much as always for being so gracious and sharing with everybody. Your, your heart is what I love most about you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. A little bit of love. One, two, three.